tell me your first and last name and uh, where and when you were born. Uh, Joe Kent. I was born in Iowa City in 1945. Uh, grew up in Cedar Rapids. We're living in Cedar Rapids, but got uh, somehow at University Hospitals in Iowa City. Uh, moved to Manchester when I was in high school. Graduated from high school in Manchester. What year was that? Uh, 1963 was high school graduation. Went to uh, State College of Iowa at the time. My claim to fame is the summer before I started my freshman year, it became uh, State College of Iowa from Iowa State Teachers College. And the summer after I graduated, they changed it to the University of Northern Iowa. So uh, I was that little chunk of time in 1967, I graduated and then started teaching um, junior high science and math in the fall of 1967. And uh, did I go past the question? That's okay. We're going to circle back to what it was like growing up in the 40s and 50s. Oh. And if you knew anybody who was in the service. Uh, both my, um, well, we go way back to my great-great-grandfather who was in the um, Civil War, uh, Alexander Kent, and then my um, grandfather, uh, Orvi Kent was um, a family legend, whatever, signed up too young to be in the service. Grandpa, in trying to get him out, in, got involved with some lawyer that charged him money where the government didn't want you in their army. They underage and they just sent you home. Well, the lawyer charged him at the time, big bucks to, to do something that was going to happen anyway. But anyway, then my uh, grandpa got back in the service in World War II. So I don't know if he gets, <laughs> he was World War I and World War II, but uh, he was in the motor pool in World War II. And then my uh, uncle, his son, my dad's brother, was in World War II. So grandpa and uncle uh, were in World War II, and an uncle on my mom's side was a Marine in World War II. So, so um, what in the your great great grandfather? What what side? What did he do in the Civil War? He was on he was on the northern side. He was a, a northerner, and uh, I just visited his uh, his uh, in uh, Troy Mills, Iowa, is where he's buried, and it was his infantry unit. Uh, on the headstone and all that sort of stuff. It was kind of like, wow, mm -hmm. long time ago. Yeah. Did they ever give you any um, any stories about him? Um, not through the family, but in Troy Mills, there's a, a lot of little towns have that person that's the mm -hmm. town historian. And I went to her 80th birthday years ago, and she was telling the story of his wife, Alexander's wife, because he died young, uh, made it through the war, but died young. And she had recollections of this lady sitting on her front porch, smoking a, um, a clay pipe. They made the old pipes out of clay. And she had his um, medal that he had gotten in the service. And I don't know what the metal was, but she'd wear that proudly on her on her house dress every day. She had that on there in her clay pipe. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of a, that's the only story I got other than my grandpa then trying to get in the service, couldn't and... How and old do you suppose he was when he was trying to get in? I think it was 16. And my dad's side of the family is on the short side. So for whoever's the recruiter or whoever signed him up, this is a pretty short individual that you maybe would have guessed wasn't 18 years old. But anyway, he got in and, and back out and then was in the motor pool, which was a pretty, again, rear assignment, fairly secure. And um, But growing up, you knew this. And did it inspire you to want to be in the military at all or did you even give it a second thought? Well, I, I never gave it a second thought. As much as we played cowboys and Indians and we played uh, GI, it was before GI Joe, 
you know, that kind of stuff as a kid. Never, I just got out of high school, thought teaching was fun, went and became a teacher, and I taught school for three years. This, this is what I'm doing. So you were going to um, you and I, can I call it you and I? Mm -hmm. Going to you and I, you were an educated man. You knew something was going on in Vietnam at the time. What were your thoughts about it at the time? Well, in college, it was like, oh, uh, can I get, uh, they had deferments, mm -hmm. and you could get deferments for various critical oper uh, occupations or student um, uh, deferments. And so I had a student deferment. Um, I was actually an elementary major. It wasn't like I was a science or math or something critical. I was just elementary major. And uh, would and you had to keep uh, reapplying, or whatever they called it. And so uh, then once I graduated in 67, I could get a teacher uh, deferment. And, and I did teach science and math at the time, which we were racing the Russians into space and everything. So that was a critical occupation. So I kept getting deferments until 1970. It's like, okay, no more deferments of any kind. And deferments went away, and then it was the um, uh, lottery system, and you were assigned um, your birth date was the critical date, and they just pulled out what number one, two, three, and my birthday's in February, and that uh, pulled out 182 or three, and so as a th three-year teaching veteran. I thought, oh, that's halfway through 365 days. I'm, I'm probably going to be teaching school next year. Well, in the little county that I was registered in, Where, which county? Delaware County, Manchester, Iowa, Delaware County, there just weren't a lot of individuals to be drafted, and the, uh, the number that Delaware County had for a quota of individuals to supply. and. I think it was, I'm relatively sure I was the last person drafted out of Delaware County in 1970. And there were uh, six of us. And, um, you know, it's a small town, so everybody knows the lady that was the Selective Service um, office in town. And, and I think the grapevine was like, well, Joe was the last <laughs> one to get drafted. So um, I, I went into it with this. It wasn't any uh, family connection or historical. It's like I got this career going, and it's, you know, sidetracked now. And uh, being, um, you know, sort of a science emphasis kind of a, a major, a second major, I thought, Oh, I'll be in a lab somewhere testing for, you know, drug usage or something or other. Well, or, tell me what you were going to tell me earlier about uh, being a lottery man. Oh, uh, when, when I got the um, uh, lottery number, 182 or whatever it was, I thought, well, this is pretty much my lifestyle because I've never signed up at anywhere. If somebody's got a drawing later on or the county fair's got drawing for all sorts, every other booth is sign up for something or other. And I'd always do that faithfully, sign it up. Publisher's Clearing House, you bet, I signed up for it and have never, ever won anything at all of any value. So I'm thinking, oh, it'll probably hold 181 or two or whatever out of 365. It's... I'm not going to win this lottery either. Well, I won that lottery and managed to get into the into the uh, military. And we had basic at... Which branch of the military? Army. So I was just drafted into the Army. And what year was that when you were drafted? 1970. Okay. And being a teacher then, the school year was over, end of May. And I was to show up at the beginning of... Well, I shouldn't say beginning. I can't remember when... Uh, we were in Des Moines for that first phase of physical processing, swear you in. They call it reception, I think. Yes. 
I think they've maybe uh, upgraded that term. I'm not sure reception was what they called it. It wasn't a warm reception, was it? Oh, it was, you know, it was processing. You're just being processed. And um, uh, so I had a little bit of time there to really kind of sort of, this is soaking in. I'm not going to be a school teacher next fall. I'm going to be doing this, but... Well, and how old were you? You were older. I was like six months from not being eligible. In a declared war, you can go past 26 for draftees. But uh, it wasn't declared. It was a, uh, I can't remember what they used to call it. So you uh, were 25? And in some months, mm -hmm. February birthday, so February to July. So pretty close to 25 and a half. And um, so it's like, oh, that, that didn't even really work out well. <laughs> it was that close. And so, of course, when I was in Vietnam, to skip to 1971, which is pretty much when I was in Vietnam, December of 70 to December of 71, the um, company commander, the captain, is a uh, lifer, career soldier, whatever you want to call it. He was older. And curiously enough, my first company commander was from Eldridge, Iowa, which is just north of Davenport here. And we would talk about, he'd, he'd give me the North Scott Press, the local paper, I'd be able to check my school district playing his school district, who won the football game, whatever. And uh, so it was, it was kind of an interesting, you know, just PFC, here I am, versus been in the military for a while. I think it was his second tour of Vietnam. And, uh, and kind of a connection there, you know, with this, I kind of know what's going on here, you don't know anything kind of thing, which was a help to me, obviously. But... Um, and my mind jumps around to where then I lose my thread sometimes. Excuse me. Well, I <laughs> edit that part. Yeah. Oh, there's there's a lot of editing. Um, let's talk a little bit about your your basic training before you oh. went, before you got into country. So after Des Moines, you then went to basic training. Where was that? Uh, Fort Leonard Wood, uh, for basic, and uh, and that was you know August in Missouri is. You know, not uh, a, a tourist destination spot, but it was. Uh, you know, I I was a student. You know, I I like school on both ends of it, and so I'm paying attention to all the dimensions of an M16. And there were a number of individuals who just absolutely didn't want to be there. And as you stand formation, and the um, uh, lieutenant would you know come by and face-to-face -face with uh, troop, the dimensions of blah, 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 and, and I usually could rattle that off. <laughs> and he and I would have fa fairly long little until he decided I'm going to go on to somebody who's not going to get this right, and I'm not going to be able to assign any push-ups because he's going to get it right. So anyway, that was kind of fun because there again, I was older than that LT that was grilling me for my training. Did they you know. give you any nicknames, like the old man or anything? No, because everybody's hair is short then. I was looking like I definitely was going to be bald when I was in high school. My high school picture could be a, you know, job interview picture of a 30-year-old or 35-year-old. Not a whole lot of hair there. And so then once everybody gets the buzz cut, it was, you know, you don't, you don't get very much, or I didn't get very much of that. But uh, looks like you hung on to the back pretty well. <laughs> I, I've replaced it with the Santa Claus look. Uh. It goes short in the summer and then long in the winter. But anyway, that well, was. Well, uh, let's let's uh, go past basic training to your advanced training. What did you do for that? And AIT was uh, uh, Des Moines to uh, uh, Leonard Wood was small, chartered. Uh, fixed wing down to Leonard Wood. Well then Leonard Wood down to Fort Polk, Louisiana was bus. So here's two buses and, the, and it was all organized. We would pull into this little diner in the middle of nowhere. Everybody out, feed you, back on the bus, off we went kind of thing. No leave in between because to finish up with uh, Joe Kent's pattern of not winning too many coin tosses, whatever you want to call it, is in uh, basic, 
I, um, um, well, right away at the beginning of basic, you get all those shots, you get a, all that rest, that processing and, and the uh, testing, and you take the typing test, or back in the day, you did all those kinds of things. I started getting um, called to the office to see if I didn't want to go to OCS with my test scores and advanced stage and stuff like that. And it's like, no, no, I just want to go back and be a teacher. It's okay. And um, so anyway, going through and just because I was a teacher, s assessing my other troop mates or platoon mates or company mates or whatever, thinking, let's see, where would the Army put me to be most productive for both sides, my side and their side? <laughs> And not knowing that that's not really the way things work. It's more of a need on their part. Where's our big gap that we need people regardless? And so I really had hopes that I would become a lab tech somewhere. I know how to run those, those tests and so on. Well, at the end of basic then, when you're assigned and I get infantry, I'm like, oh, this is not a, um, a match. And so that was the first time I really confronted uh, an officer with uh, the logic of matching your personnel with the, the uh, advanced MOS <laughs> they were assigned. And of course that was not within their power or control or anything else. They hadn't done it to Joe personally. And of course I was making a fairly articulate, I felt, argument. And so now I'm off to... Um, to um, infantry AIT, where. Uh, Stop you right there. If I push this button, will it turn on? Yep. yep. I'm going to give us just a little. There. Oh, I like that. Okay. It warmed it up in here a little bit. You're we getting kind of blue with the clouds going over. Mm -hmm. All right. Now I'm ready to talk about AIT. And so off I go to Fort Polk. Which is where Rollins and I are going this summer. Really? Ah. Mm -hmm. In so the summer. Maybe we'll take some pictures for you. <laughs> oh, I hope so. Mm -hmm. There's a couple in my book here of the uh, drill sergeant stand in front of the barracks. Nice. Uh, D, D43, I think, where you learn to shout out at very high volume. Those Back in the day, they're relatively uh, obscene. Um, go. calls. Yep, 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 yep. And... Um, and some of the guys that I was drafted with. In fact, I think maybe the picture of the six sum was there. Anyway, I went down and did, and so I'm, I'm putting together that this is fairly serious now. I am in infantry training. The only place I know in the world right now that they're sending infantry is Vietnam. That's when it started to bang, really hit me between the ears. And so, being a student again, I'm paying attention. If they're teaching me some tactic, some trick, some something or other, I'm paying attention, unlike some of my fellow um, draftees that I think <laughs> had a mindset of, if I look really incompetent, maybe they won't <laughs> send me. <laughs> and I'm like, well, I hope I'm not in your, you know, your squad, your platoon, your whatever. This is not going to be fun because I, I had some, I think partially because of my looks, partially because of my age, partially because of my teaching background, uh, a little bit of a, a disciplinary kind of a, we're going to do this and we're not going to, you know, somebody's life's going to hang on this. We're not going to be screwing around. So anyway, um, went through that and... Well, at uh, AIT, do you remember anything specifically that you're like, man, I'm glad I was listening to that later on? Anything that came in Well, um, just because this hit my head first, let me say this. Okay. Along with this not winning the lottery thing, uh, out on one of your field exercises with birds going over and, and um, the drill sergeants firing over your head and so on, one of the things they always teach you is you hit the ground belly first. You don't go down on your back because then you're not at all oriented to where, where the opposition is. And so, you know, it's okay you listen to that and there's a little of that. You know you heard that, but it's not an instinct yet. 
you haven't done that under any kind of pressure yet. <laughs> so the first time we're out there, and um, as they went over, they had little bags of flour, and they would throw them at you and mark where rounds, live rounds would have gone kind of thing. And <laughs> I hit my back, and you may need to edit this part, boom, right in the crotch, I get this bag of flour. And I'm going, if this had been real life, I'm, I'm a dead duck. I lost the lottery again. This is like, no way. <laughs> I, I'm, not, I'm not cut out for this. You know, it was that kind of a thing. Last time you landed on your back, what? Yes. Well, no. Uh, <laughs> there's a Vietnam story about that. But anyway, um, through all of that and, and liking education and so on, I've always felt like the people that are the instructors, the teachers, the professors, whatever along the way, the drill sergeants, the instructors in basic and AIT, were really telling me the essence that they had boiled down from their experience and I'm benefiting from this. That's why I'm paying attention. This isn't just a time waster. And um, so I, I had a lot of that sense, sort of trusting in the system to give me the tools that I needed uh, down the road, whatever that would be. And so then it was just my own translation of, okay, now I get the fact that you don't go down on your back ever. Okay, I got it, I got it. And, and some other things as well. And because, and I, I was not, uh, as an adult, a weapons person at all. I'm not an NRA member or any of that sort of stuff, but had apparently some aptitude to that with expert marksmen in a couple weapons and, and things like that. And so then you're kind of confident, well, if it comes down to just I can handle the weapon, you have a little confidence. I might survive this. So anyway, uh, that was kind of um, the essence is I'm trusting in what I'm being told. And, and they are very good, uh, I felt like at that time. Um, these were experienced people. They had been in Vietnam. They, this wasn't some, uh, not to insult college professors, but they went right from college to their PhD to, a, to professor. Okay, how many years did you teach school and you really know this works or doesn't work? Or you felt these people knew what they were doing. And, um, and so I don't know that I could pick out this technique or that technique or other than pull maintenance on your weapon so it does work when you need it to, that kind of thing. That's just real obvious. But at the end of AIT then, there are assignments, another chance, because I should have mentioned that was the second time I went face to face with, a, with an officer about <laughs> my qualifications and the career path that I seem to be on in the military. Um, is not the most uh, valuable for either side. And well, it's out of their hands, it's just this, what are the needs? those slots get filled up and then on and on. And uh, I'd already had a friend from Delaware County got drafted with out of basic was assigned at the um, at West Point. And he had been a, a uh, student at Iowa in uh, athletic training. Mm -hmm. And somebody that had been at Iowa was at, at West Point at the time knew this and could ask for an individual. That would be the only exception to we've got this gap and we're filling it with, with uh, people. So he spent his time in West Point and I was going this other career path. So um, again, there was something that I was gonna about AIT. Anyway, at the end then when you start getting assigned, uh, the drill sergeants both in basic and AIT, I think because they were more my age, they'd been in for a while, went in at 1920 or something, had gone through, had a tour back doing the drill sergeant thing, and I think probably re related to me, and I just saw them as an authority figure. They're the drill sergeant, you know, there is no way we ever talk, you know, person to person. This is drill sergeant to trainee. 
I get it. If I don't, I'm doing push-ups, okay? Uh, but they, they, in both cases, they kind of just on the QT when you're taking a smoke break, whatever, in training would, how's it going, Joe? Holding up, okay? <laughs> this kind of thing. And so one of them was talking to me in AIT about, well, you know that even though this is advanced infantry training, some percentage don't go to Vietnam. They go to Germany. They go to stateside someplace. And, um, you know, just it may work out. It may work out. Well, it didn't. I get assigned to Vietnam. So um, off to, was it Portland? Now I can't remember where you sat and processed, waited for the paper to go, and then over to Vietnam. And uh, <clears throat> I think that's... It might have been Fort Lewis. I think maybe that was it. I think that was it. Uh, the other thing is I remember it was there to Alaska to Japan and as you're landing in Japan and none of those places do you get out of that containment area for you guys. Uh, you don't get to go to the duty-free shop <laughs> or where any civilians are. And coming into um, Japan, whatever air field or port it was, you were uh, flying over at the end of the runways, the machine gun or anti-aircraft, maybe they were, um, um, structures from oh, World yes. War II. Yes. And it was like, whoa, here's, here's a country that's, you know, got some history. And, um, and then from there down to uh, Vietnam. And in Vietnam, at that, at that time, it was a one-week in-country um, uh, update. What's the latest on how are they booby trapping? What are we seeing? Da da da. And uh, really kind of uh, not telling you not to pay attention to what you had in basic and AIT, but this is really what's going on now. You need to pay attention to that. And then um, made it out to the um, fire base to meet the company that was back on the fire base between missions. Uh, and where was that? I can't remember because I'm talking those triangular fire bases with a mortar on each point okay. and they all... And it was just en route to where you ended up permanently? Well, uh, I was joining the company I was with there. The company was back from a mission, and so I think we were maybe a, in the rear for a day until they came back on, and they pulled security on the fire base while the other companies were out, and they kind of did a ro rotation, and then we'd go out, and somebody would come back and pull security. I remember one thing we forgot to talk about is what, what was your unit of assignment? Uh, it, at the time, it was 1st Cav, and it was Delta Company first of the eighth and I left Delta Company second of the eighth because in being out in the bush one of my general impressions of that is you're really dis disconnected from the rest of the world, the rest of Vietnam, the rest of you were just out there in the bush and so at some point in time I went from D18 to D28 didn't have a clue that that had happened. Sometime in the rear we, and there were guys that were gone, and uh, I did not seem to pick up on this transition at all, and it was, I was there in 71, so that's when they were starting to uh, pull back, and uh, fewer forces, and that type of thing. So anyway, I get out to the fire base, and um, get assigned, that was the company commander that was from Eldridge, just north of and uh, how you do, and my um, uh, platoon lieutenant was from Dartmouth. He was this uh, Ivy League school and, ha and had the Dartmouth uh, accent and, and everything else. And um, uh, squad later, as you know, this squad, and you'll be walking point. And I'm like, okay, just point of clarification, what is that? Well, you're the first one in the 
in the column as you're going through the and it's like okay LT what makes sense about that it's my first week in the country and you're gonna put me up there and I'm feeling that this is a position of responsibility there's a whole bunch of lives behind me that are going to rely on Joe having uh, fairly good skills at this and well you can talk to the company commander if you want to. Go. So I'm just, you know, it's a fire base. I could throw my M16 all the way across the thing. So I go see the guy from, that's when I figured out or found out he was from Eldridge. And I'm doing this whole, because I'd practiced it in basic. <laughs> I had this down. I could have sent him a, at that time, what, it, what would it have been, a cassette tape of my uh, whole argument. And... Um, he said, well, uh, I got one thing to tell you. It's the Army's policy to not create um, orphans or um, widows. You married? Uh, well, sir, I think you probably know the answer. Yes, you're not. Do you have kids? You know, that sort of, ha ha, do you have kids? You No, don't have any kids other than if you count my students. And, uh, well, that puts you right in line, and somebody just de roast back home, and we need somebody in that position. And it's like, oh, man, sir, this is going to be a lot of blah, blah, blah. And um, that's the way it is. Uh, we're not going to change that. And so somebody that's married and has a kid is carrying a box of M60 ammo behind me. And uh, I'm walking up front and thinking, this may be the biggest loss of any coin flip that I've had so far, because I'm really not feeling confident just my position in this hole. Uh, one thing I learned from the uh, lieutenant from Dartmouth is he always referred to it as the OD circus. And so um, as I was leading the OD circus, I don't think I'm a drum major at. I'm not supposed to be out here in front with, uh, and the reality of walking point is in a company in the field, there's three platoons, and each day a different platoon is the lead platoon. So in a three-day period, you're only walking point one day, so you had a little time to catch your breath between. But uh, early, early on in there, it wasn't the lead platoon, so I was not walking point. We're walking along, and it comes back that we had wandered across uh, the uh, black pajamas that the VC wore, the factory, which is just out in the bush, and their treadle sewing machines. And um, somebody was assigned uh, to, um, uh, you know, somebody with weapons to kind of protect them. I don't know what to call it, but. Uh, they initiated some contact to hold to get us down while uh, the individuals were gone. But then we walked into the to the factory, and the machines were there, and the bolts of black cloth were there, and some sewn, and some just cut out, and and they had just taken off. Well, uh, as we kind of were moving up around the uh, location, um, somebody ran off a magazine and I'll be darned if I didn't hit my back thinking oh no oh no oh no and I don't know what it was but these as I'm looking straight up which is not the way to be at all I'm seeing these tracers just in line with me just coming right down my head down to my, and, I'm, and they're getting closer and closer and then they stopped and I remember thinking wow, I wonder if this is what being dead is like. Because they're getting closer, I knew the next round was, and there's a whole feel to it, just be set. In training, they give you that uh, sense of what rounds sound like going overhead. You know, you're behind a bunker, so you're not gonna get hit, but they shoot from different directions, and you get a sense of which way the fire's coming from, and that sort of thing. And so they're tracers. I know where they're coming from, and they're getting closer and closer, and they stop. And I, and I just, that was one of my main remembrances is, wow, I must be dead, and this is that in-between time or whatever it is, I don't know. 
And then all of a sudden it started up again. I'm like, wait a minute, I'm not dead. So quickly roll over and start doing the routine. And uh, I thought, oh, I just, I just missed it. I just missed it. And of several times, that was the first I just missed it moment. And that training, I, I don't know how it is today. I don't know how it is today, but, but one of my thoughts was there needed to be something along there that just got it to be, you absolutely went stomach first, stomach first, stomach first, instead of just, here I am again. I got hit with the flower, and now I'm... But uh, I made it through that, so... That kind of got me into country, and... So that happened pretty early on? Yes. That was your welcome? Yes. It's like like one of those kinds of things in life where you do something really dumb and you look around like, did anybody else see me do that totally stupid thing? And of course, in a fire fate, nobody's looking around for people doing stupid stuff. You're just really trying to get uh, fire superiority. And uh, uh, that was one of those where, okay, Joe, you just have to commit to you're not doing that ever again. And uh, And it does. It was like, Hello, here we are, um, as, as one of the biggies. What was your um, area of coverage that you had for your patrols? Do you remember? We're in three core, so our rear was Benoit, which is just outside of Saigon, not very far, but it was towards the Cambodian border, and a lot of the uh, old timers when I got in country had gone into Cambodia when they went in and it was this big oh my god an international crisis we've crossed the line we're in Cambodia have we invaded Cambodia and all of that panic kind of stuff and all of those guys were like man Joe we were just we were days hauling the stuff out of there that was just up against they have trees with really large buttress roots and they just tuck it in there put a tarp over it come over and harass the GIs and back over and they're resupplied. And it took all of that away. So 1971, I usually, talking with other Vietnam vets in the late 60s, I say, well, I was there in, in the easy year because thanks to all you guys that went over to Cambodia, we didn't have those little, you know, one or two individual contacts that ended up with we get hurt a whole lot more than they do because it's just the two of them and they can fly around and not fly around but sting you and you're trying to figure out where they are. So anyway we were right along the Cambodian border at various fire bases around there and um, well, a lot of guys that I talk to um, explain it that it's days upon days of extreme boredom followed by minutes and seconds of extreme terror. Was that your daily routine? I, how would you put it into words? I, I wouldn't do that at all. Those were the guys in the late 60s mm -hmm. where they got hit by big groups and it was really heavy for a period of time and then one side or the other would disconnect and then it was as you described, I felt like it was one, one, not wandering, shouldn't say it that way, but out there on a mission and you just, and maybe it was walking point. Maybe those guys in the back with, I, I always wanted to write the Defense Department and ask them if the next contract for metal boxes of M16 ammo could come with an absorptive layer to keep the rounds from banging into the can. It was just like a baby rattle. You could hear it all over and it's like, come on guys, I'm up here. I need your help. Quit making it sound like we are a parade walking down Main Street. And so I felt like it was wandering around with a knot in your stomach all the time, like looking for trip wires, looking for something hanging out of the bamboo, looking for some eyes looking back at you because they heard the rattles behind me and they got down and I'm walking right up to them. And uh, it was that. It was like every time you were out, that's, that's much more of what it was rather than 
because we did have really small contacts and it's like you know with all company we just blasted it for how many seconds and they're they're gone because it's like okay this is a whole lot more GIs than I thought I'm out of here and they knew where they were going they knew where the trotter was and and so it it wasn't the what you described it was much more just having this uh, 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 on edge nervous tension that's the worst part yes yes Yep. You almost wish for something to happen, right? Just so that you would justify. Because once I learned that I was hitting my stomach on the way down, you got it on rock and roll, and the first magazine's about used up, and then you grab the next one, and you're going, and this is what you do. But when you're walking around and you don't know what's around the next corner, that really—I wish I could say it made my hair fall out, but that wasn't it. It was. <laughs> it was. Uh, but it it did. College made your hair fall. Out. That's right. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Well, did you ever have the opportunity to be in the rear? Did they? What was your sight uh, like? My most rear was just I had walk point yesterday, so then my platoon was the the uh, you know the last in the column. But you were still moving. Right. So. Right. And so I was, the only time I was really in the rear is if we went out on a, like a squad recon and, okay, there's nothing out here, so we'll just follow our tracks. Well, then you don't invert the column. I mean, everybody turns around. And so now the guy in the back knew where he was going. That's where we came from. And you only go out a couple hundred meters or something, and then you follow it back. and. And I found that to be unnerving because now I'm looking behind me, like I'm not walking into it. It's like it's coming up behind me. Exactly. But that cushion behind you was nice. Yes. Yep. Yep. Um, have you ever calculated how much you walked? Um, I, I think with the helicopters, with the Hueys, it wasn't as much because there were times that we'd be out for a day and they wanted us to go and so pick them up, drop them off there. So it wasn't like we were walking this, you know, miles and miles, which were clicks, we were, were kilometers. And um, my recollection would have been more of <laughs> the amount of up and down to get this one click on somebody's topo map. It was <laughs> this and this and up and down and the pack and I didn't really have to carry much for ammo as a um, as a point man and I don't know how long into it I uh, was issued the um, they took an M16 and they put a, a M79 grade grenade launcher underneath it it was called an over under so you could uh, go through a magazine of M16 or the single shot grenade which would be everything from a uh, high explosive to a buckshot round to a marking round to uh, whatever and there was a vest to that with the little pouches for all the little 79 rounds and but then your pack and you know the food and water for three days before the next resupply and what so kind I of other things were in your pack? well I just ran across a little thing that I carried with family photos and, you know, just little things like that. Um, some writing material so you could write um, a ways into it. I actually ordered from the PX a camera and I was going to start documenting and <laughs> you don't go documenting down walking through the jungle snapping. Um, yes, no, they hadn't invented selfies at the time. But uh, uh, you know, everybody had um, oh, like Heinz 57 or A1 or some hot sauce or something, because they had those freeze-dried meals, and that's pretty much the definition of bland. And so you'd be uh, firing those up with some sort of thing. So, um, and then somebody would be carrying the uh, PX catalog which was very much like the Sears catalog. It had everything from soup to nuts in it and 
uh, that would pass around. Somebody would want to be looking for this or that. So it was mostly smoke grenades or hand grenades or uh, your magazines were the weighty items. Well, in the water, you know, you'd have the two quart uh, containers. Uh, if you didn't catch a come along vine that would hook it and then it's leaking out, it's Get out quick. Yes. Yep. Yep. Um, did you uh, did you jerry rig anything on your pack? Like, uh, I tried to keep mine uh, pretty pretty abbreviated. You know, I knew I was going to hit the ground on my stomach. I didn't want this huge weight then to where I'm flattened and am not doing anything. So I really didn't have. Um, early on, I sort of had a philosophy that I'd lost all these coin tosses, so I'm not going to make it home. It's it's clear. So um, we didn't have any kind of um, vest uh, kinds of things at the time, and so I just, uh, without any hair to absorb sweat, I just took the waistband out of some underwear and pinned it to and, and made a headband, and then I'd put uh, one of those <coughs> OD um, handkerchiefs. I mean, even the handkerchiefs were OD. And, you know, I thought, well, in instead of this shiny bald head, I've now got that kind of camouflage, and I'm just fine with that because, um, you know, if, if it's around, it's going to go through the helmet, it's going to go through my head, uh, done deal. Why bother? Because to me, it was something in the way. It was not. It wasn't an advantage to me. Well, then another company commander. Everybody had to, or your ass was grass, or whatever. And so it's like, okay, fine. I'm going to have to wear this thing. And it was just more weight. It was just. It wasn't really going to be a save my life thing. Especially on your neck. Yes. Being out in the bush so much, did you ever get mail or anything like that? Oh, uh, resupply. If you were out for more than three days, you got resupply in three days. So you only carried enough of the, was it LERPs? I can't remember what the, what, no, what am I thinking of? Anyway, those freeze-dried things, okay, those were, like an MRE? MRE, that's right, I'm sorry, I, meal ready to eat, right. Uh, but then you had to carry the water to pour in there to heat over your heat tabs, blah blah blah, and uh, and sea rations were they they really should have developed a way. I think we could have made some headway with civilian uh, PR if they would have just thrown back on the resupply bird the sea rations that the guys didn't want. But you'd pick out the pound cake and a couple other the desserts. And then there were a couple main uh, entrees that were palatable. And so, and all the rest of it was just, you know, take it back to the villagers or something and, you know, uh, let them have it. Would uh, they accept it willingly? Well, I don't. I don't know. I never made it to the villages. It was. Be hilarious if they're like, no thanks. I'd rather starve. <laughs> no, I think um, I still wear a, a Montagnard bracelet. Montagnards were hill people in Three Corps, and they would take, I don't know what U.S. material had been discarded. I have a feeling it was some sort of electrical cord. They'd strip the insulation and bend it in the loop and then put some little sort of a etched design on it. And of course then whenever you were around, they wanted U.S. for it. They didn't want the uh, okay. Vietnam or they didn't want, the, the Army gave you a, um, I can't think of the name of it, a uh, military I, Yeah, I've seen them. You note. can only buy them at the PX. Yes, because. right. So that we weren't helping the black market by putting U.S. dollars out there. But um, 
you know, I think if you'd have given a little kid something or other, uh, you know, they couldn't even read what it was on the can, they'd have opened it and probably eaten it. I don't think they were like, no, 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 no. Especially if it was still in the tin. But they probably uh, still use the tin for something else, too. Yes, yes. Yep. Um, so you pretty much just ate MREs and C rations part mm -hmm. of the time? Mm -hmm. um, and your mail and, um, well, here's, here's kind of an obvious duh question, but where would you sleep? Well, um, just while on the ground. And that was something else that you carried. Some people were a little Wait, bit more. Um, can you start it over again, like a complete sentence? We slept on the ground. On the ground. We slept on the ground, and um, you had your poncho. And some people, well, and another company commander came along with no hammocks because you're that much higher off the ground, that much more of a target, or, you know, just stray fire, whatever. So it was on the ground, on your uh, poncho, and um, boots on, M16 right there, because you were part of the perimeter at a, at a night loc or night location. And uh, the way it, we ran it at that time is each squad had their um, radio telephone operator, RTO, and the radio would go around the perimeter, or at least through your squad, through the night. And so you'd get awakened, here's the radio, and the, um, the uh, company commander's CP, their radio out, and they would do the same kind of rotation. You'd get these sit reps, and then you'd just break squelch, you'd just hit the button, and it would make that ksh, ksh sound. And so then you were up watching, then you'd hand it to the next guy who was just here to the table in the perimeter and just sitting on the ground and that leads me to, for the longest time anybody would ask me about Vietnam, I would just tell, because it was like, I don't know if this person is going to take offense to me being in Vietnam and all that or thank you for your service. It's just recently I started getting thank you for your service. And so uh, I would usually tell them something, you know, like getting hit in the crotch with the flower or one of those kinds of ha ha ha. And so there were various times you're laying there on the ground and it would come around that the uh, whatever birds could pick up the infrared mm -hmm. at night looking for human bodies, they could also easily pick up an elephant or something like that. So there were... Um, Oh, three or four times this herd of elephants going because they, it's hot during the day, so they're feeding at night and they're just walking along feeding and they're apparently an animal that really gets spooked easily. And I'm laying there going, oh my God, I don't want to go home in a body bag with elephant prints all over me. And, oh, how did your son die in <laughs> Vietnam? Oh, he was trampled by elephants. And so you're just and the hammock wouldn't have helped that, you know, it's just they're going to trample down the bamboo and everything else as they go through. And then there were a couple nights where the uh, monkeys would get to be playing up in the trees, and I'm like, oh, I hope somebody doesn't think they're going to light up a monkey, because then that's going to be a mess. And uh, it, was, it was pretty much just laying on the ground, and then the rainy season was like a whole different category, because now you're trying to tie your your poncho off between <clears throat> and still have something of a, of a secure perimeter, which is kind of an oxymoron in that, at that time. But then you were pretty much on the ground, which is already wet. You're already muddy. It just is, it's a whole lot different than, than in a desert. <laughs> I always wondered what that's like for those guys. There had to be those kinds of stories relative to sand that we had with with rainy season and. Um, what uh, What do you think would go through your mind that would help you at the time get through? What kind of things would you think about back home? You know, I I didn't very much. One of the male things there was a an older gal, um, um, 
when I started teaching and an English teacher and so a couple times the year that I was over there in 71 I would get packets of letters and it was like everybody else was excited because they're not getting very much mail it's like you want to read an eighth graders letter oh yeah 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 and they were great they were English assignments so it was supposed to be complete sentences and punctuation and back in the day when uh, instead of creative writing and they were they were really you know that that was kind of okay it's worth it being over here kind of a sensation but I think I didn't because I think I had adopted that I don't know how it's gonna happen there's there's no I'm here there's no going to Canada or something from Vietnam this is it I gotta just kinda hold it together but I really don't have much confidence and so it wasn't you know um, it wasn't a yearning for back home or without wife or kids or anything like that it wasn't um, uh, in my experience that wasn't you didn't daydream about pizza and ice cream nah no, it was just too much of that, just 24-7 knot in the stomach about when is, when are we either going to walk up to somebody or somebody's going to walk up to us. That, and I, I just couldn't get myself past that. I couldn't wind down. And not that a fire base is any, because it's just like a, a stationary target. You know, it's like right there. They know exactly where it is. And you're just sleeping in a um, culvert section, whatever they call those, with sandbags over it. And that was another one of my early on experiences. I'm, because it's Vietnam, so it's fairly hot and humid in there. And of course, you couldn't sleep up on top of the sandbags because then you were the highest thing that stray rounds might hit. And so. You know, I don't know. Somebody was coming around all the time chasing you back in. So I'm in there going, baby, baby, baby. <laughs> and all of a sudden, I'm realizing that I'm on the freeway between wherever the rats spend their day and the mess hall. And it's like, oh, jeez. Now I'm going to get bit by a rat with rabies, and that's going to be my demise. I go home in a body bag. <laughs> How'd he die? Oh, rabies, bitten by a rabid rat. And... It, it, you just, I don't know, I didn't ever get to that thinking outside of my um, circumstance right then and there. I know some guys do, and they, to this day, they talk that way, and it's like, you know, I don't think I was that, I think I was too much in that I've lost every coin flip along the way. Um, do you think even when you were a short-timer that it ever went away, or were you always... I did... After 10 months and whatever, I got the company clerk job. Um, and that was, wow, I think I'm going to make it home. You know, it really was. That was the time. And I, and I really don't even think about that too much. It's, it's all the, the boonie time in my mind. But I did get back to the rear. I could take showers regularly. There was a mess hall. <laughs> it was... You got to watch the whatever movie on the side of some building, and it was just kind of back to civilization. It really was like, I, and I, I was certainly still in Vietnam, certainly on a military base, all that sort of stuff, but it was really much more of that. And I think maybe, thanks for asking that question, because I think that is really when I did start thinking about going back and my teaching job and I wonder what's happening at school because they quite literally built a junior high between when I left and when I got back so it was but didn't know anything about that until I got to the rear and um, where where was the rear at for you um, it was well when I got to the rear it was Benoit the rear oh no I can't get it and I think it was the rear when it was D18, and then when I got in the rear, it was D28, and it was Benoit, which is a pretty good sized base. But I'm just a clerk typist, and I didn't get out of the, you know, the first cab area where some of the 
guys that were in the rear the whole time would be actually in the village, or not village, probably town of Benoit and this, that, and the other thing. And uh, while I was in Vietnam, we got to go. There was an in-country R&R, and particularly if you'd had a contact and lost somebody, they would quickly uh, Huey to a uh, strip and then uh, I've forgotten now, C-130 something. And you talk about, am I going to fall out of this thing? It's a war zone, so they're going up <laughs> pretty dang straight up, and you're looking straight out the back of this, straight down, going, I got this heavy pack. I'm going to be sliding out the back of it. But uh, they went to Vung Tau, which was the French Riviera of uh, Vietnam, because when they had French occupation, they had wonderful French restaurants and they had hotels that had amenities and that sort of thing. And um, t as sort of a de-stressor, you'd get sent to uh, Vung Tau for three days, whatever, and then back to back out to the fire base and the bush and that sort of thing. And so I got to do that twice in country. And then, or uh, I'm sorry, not in country, twice when I was in the bush, and then once when I was in the rear, the um, uh, first sergeant and I drove a Jeep in a uh, trailer with clean uh, uh, shirts and pants and other supplies, more specific. But there was actually a, a military, welcome to Vung Tau, R&R uh, Center, and and they were tents, but they were, you know, cots and everything, and a mess hall there if you chose to eat, the, eat there, and you could check out surfboards and... Did you actually relax a little bit while you were there? Yep, yep. You could really feel like... I've got pictures of some, some rear echelon individual had a Honda 750 with a flag tank on it and all this, and I'm like, this isn't even fair. This isn't even like being in in a foreign country. And um, you got to wander the streets of Vung Tau and ride the public transportation, and it's like, wow, this really is a R and R. It's just in country, and it it was just like this is like quantum leap from my day to day kind of experience and and um, the first time I think it was just like oh whoo and you really do unwind and you really do and I'm I'm just talking about when you're taking a dump out in the bush you do not want to catch a loose round when you're taking a dump how did your son die well he was taking a crap out and then got shot it's just you're just tense the whole time and here you're just able to sit there and relax <laughs> lay on the beach. You knew you weren't going to have any snipers, any landmines, anything else. It was just really, you got to be away. And um, um, how long that was you, good. How long were you in country total? Well, that's a, another, I got there December 10th, I'll say, and Bob Hope was the week after that. I was a cherry, so all the old timers got to go to it, and I'm still out pulling, pulling duty. Then to get people, I think even as much as February home for Christmas time, they had a standard procedure of at the 10th, I think I went home the 8th, but by the time if you came January 1, you had already gone home at the 12th or the 13th. They kind of compressed that so the people even um, from February to February, or more like February to December, uh, which was a nice thing, I thought. It only did two days for me, but by that time I was in the rear, I was typing up my own, you know, paperwork and, and that sort of thing. So... This was about 12 months. Right. Two days short, and I was out of country by the time Bob Hope came back. So every, a lot of people say, oh, did you see Bob Hope? It's like, no. And there's a story there. So. Um, well, I'm thinking about getting it wrapped up because I think we're towards the end. 
Um, but did anything else happen in country that we need to discuss before we discuss about coming home? Um, I, you know, in the in the long view, I don't know if it did any good or not. But while I was there, there was a Chu Hoi project, and they tried to, I, to me, it was to get the uh, black pajamas separated from the villagers. That if you gave them sea rations, they would have been happy. If if you didn't shoot them, they were happy because the VC were were rotten to them. You know, if you don't join us, we're going to shoot your family, kind of thing. And then if we catch you, it's like if you don't tell us what you know, we're shooting you or pushing you out of a helicopter or something or other. And so uh, the Chuhoi would allow the people to, to move to these zones that were supposed to be safe for them. And they, they wanted to move at night because the VC then would pick them up during the day and where are you going and and that sort of thing. And so we were, our job, we'd set up the night location along these trotters or these trails or whatever, and we didn't shoot them. And so I feel good about that because of those people got to a safe place and we didn't get all trigger happy and light them up and here's, you know, somebody that really was trying to be on our side or, or whatever you want to call it. And, um, and I thought that was, you know, if you're in there in somebody else's country fighting for them, you don't want to really shoot them. <laughs> it's uh, not very productive. So that part I felt good about. Um, otherwise, it was just a real kind of beginning to end, a real frustrating thing. It wasn't coming home, and maybe I'm jumping ahead into this coming home. It wasn't coming home like World War II. Even though there were people that protested and we're against World War II. When you come home the victor and you've saved the globe, that all goes away. And that didn't happen with Vietnam. So... What was your experience like coming home? Well, I think by that time, again, it was 71. All these other years and all these other nightly newscasts, eating supper, watching the GIs do something that maybe you objected to. Um, I think the military had learned that you process these people. We got to Oakland um, in the middle of the night, went and had our steak. You're having your one free steak when you get home at 2 o'clock in the morning. Okay, it loses a little something. And then uh, you were expressly told to be in civvies the whole time, not be traveling home in your uniform. Well, to me, what did we have? The PX civvies were pretty dorky looking at that time when you realize hippies and bell bottoms and all that sort of stuff. When you went and dressed in a plaid shirt and probably relatively form fitting slacks instead of something bell bottom ish. And your haircut. You might as well, and your haircut. You might as well had your serial number on your forehead. It was but we were at the airport before it opened. I remember sitting there. And then you're sitting there next to this OD bag. That's kind of a giveaway too. But it was so early in the morning and first in line and on the plane and you know people are looking at you but nobody really said anything and I'm from the Midwest so when I got to Cedar Rapids, Iowa which is where my folks picked me up it was the middle of the night because we had uh, some something or other, I don't remember, but uh, anyway, by the time we made it from the West Coast to Cedar Rapids, we had left at the butt crack of <laughs> dawn, excuse me, but we were get, getting home at night. And so the only people at the airport were my mom and dad and my um, aunt and uncle and their spouses. My, my dad had a brother and a sister, so by aunt, his wife, and aunt and her husband, uncle and his wife, and that was it. And they were all very glad to see me. And it was just like, we're glad you're home and all that, and not a bunch of, well, what did you do? And so, and the other part of it, I was really lucky um, when I got to Manchester, you have a month, and it was Christmas time, and everybody's kind of up about that. And here's Joe. I could have been coming home from teaching school and just being at my folks house for the holidays is 
far as most people knew, and um, didn't have a lot of hair, so the haircut thing with me was not that that uh, showy. And so that was an easy transition. And then that spring, of course, if you're a teacher, you don't just come back and get your job back. It's the middle of a school year. You have to wait until the next August. And so I had some really good friends in my hometown that really just, we just did guy things. We, that's when I bought my first motorcycle with them, and we just rode on their farms, and they'd go to work during the day, and I'd go back to where we rode the day, the evening before, and it was just an easy transition. A lot of the emotion or whatever could just, I'm just tearing around out in somebody's woodlot and, you know, uh, just just decompressing. And I think that was excellent. Uh, I don't know that that would have worked for everybody, but I think it did for me. And uh, it took, I really don't know how I made it through the f however many years, because I taught junior high. Junior high can be mouthy and not really um, um, malice of forethought way. It just comes out. And I can't believe I didn't smack some kid or something or other. Did your students have interesting questions when you started back? I, I didn't really, uh, you know, they had, a, had another teacher the year before. It was seventh and eighth grade, so I would end up maybe having them both years. And it wasn't, I didn't make, Oh, I've been at war, you know. I, nope, not going there. And they're junior high kids. They're sort of into themselves anyway. And so that was probably a good thing, too, other than when it did get to be some kid kind of challenging, I wanted, I want the class to do this and they want to do something else. I could just feel like, kid, you're really <laughs> looking to... Uh, and I... And I I seem to be able to keep a lid on it. I'm kind of surprised about that because there were times that the flashbacks would be coming and it's like, um, and by that time, of course, it was instinctive. I never hit the ground on my back ever again for anything, whatever it was. And, um, and, and so I think that was good. I didn't come back to a situation where I didn't have a job and I'm just this unemployed Vietnam vet. I really thank the principal uh, that held on to my job because just as a little sidelight story, um, because I didn't know this, I just always understood that when you're in the military and you came home, if you had a job and you went to the military, you got your job back. Every single job in the United States of America, according to my senator and representative at the time, that's true. The only jobs not covered by that are public schools. They do not have to give you your job back. And so my principal is very good. I don't think he knew this. I think um, he just wanted me back. And so he hired, uh, here in Davenport is a, a Palmer College of Chiropractic, and he would hire spouses of students because he knew that when they were done with Palmer, off they went. And so the first year was a lady, her husband was a senior, or whatever they call it, at Palmer, and then she was gone. The next year was somebody else, and then I'm back, and I got my job. But uh, when I started the school year and I looked at my teacher contract, I'm like, well, this says that I'm a fourth-year teacher with BA degree, blah, blah, blah. That's not right, because you're supposed to get your job back and be at whatever pay level your experience and would have been had you not left. And so I went to the school board and uh, was all dressed up in a suit that I had bought in Hong Kong, <laughs> tailored to my shape, and uh, started to make my case like, this isn't right. And a couple of the board members just took exceptions. No, no, this is where you blah, blah, blah. And, I'm, and finally I said to him, you know, if I'd have been assigned stateside, if I'd have been behind a desk in Vietnam, you wouldn't even see me here. I'd be so glad to be back. Okay, fine. But I did get shot at. I did shoot at people. And this is not the way it works anywhere else. Well, we don't have to do that. And, and um, so 
I'm like, well, what else can I say? What else can I say? Because two out of the school board. So finally the superintendent told the secretary to go get the file of uh, a fellow that I had started teaching with in 67. He got drafted because he was the vocal teacher. He really lost his deferment and everything else. There was not very much critical about a vocal teacher. And so he went... Um, in 68 into the service and he was back in 70. I had gone in 70 and was back in 72. So the secretary went out and got the folder and, and opened it up to the superintendent and the main uh, board member against my being placed where I wanted to be was right next to him and he slid it over and the guy was visibly upset and just took the folder and slammed it shut and wouldn't say another thing and the superintendent said something about well it seems like we have a precedent here that this other person when he came back probably just a clerical thing somebody thought this is the way it works not knowing that school districts don't have to abide by that had put him at and luckily he came back to the school district he didn't go someplace else for a teaching job they had put him at that step and they had a precedent, they had to do it. And this school board member was so upset and I thought, this to me is my welcome back from Vietnam of disrespect that so many of the other people got in a more active way, whatever. But this guy was going to impact my, my income for the rest of my career because I would have been those two years behind the whole rest of my career. And he was okay with that. He wasn't like, well, thank you for your service and we'll put you there. He, he very much was distressed that he had to go along with paying a Vietnam vet that level. And so that, to me, was, I didn't have any of those other experiences when I talked to vets about how they, you know, how they were treated or some of their job experiences or job search experiences. But that, um, and later on I had his two sons in class, and it's like, well, I'm going to treat your sons better than you treated me. So, That's good. yeah, yeah, it was. It was sort of payback in a <laughs> subtle way. Well, I think we're getting wrapped up. All righty. Um, is there anything else that you want to discuss uh, that we didn't get to? Um... I, while I'm thinking about that, I did go on an honor flight as a, as a um, I don't want to call it caretaker, but a chaperone, whatever you want to call it, for a World War II vet. And that's a wonderful experience. I would say, if you get a chance, do it. And what else? I can't think of anything else. They just, they just dwindled down to walking past the berm around a village and some little bitty tyke comes up, turns around, sits, squats, takes a dump, looks at us GIs walking by. It's just a different world when you go from the U.S. to these other places that we tend to be in conflicts. And it, it's, a, it's a quantum leap. It's not just they have outhouses. They just... <laughs> Let it go and that's it. And that, that was one thing that I just thought to ask, and this goes way back to you when you first got there. What was your culture shock like? Uh, I don't think the culture shock, uh, and maybe it would be called that. I was going to say I, I wouldn't call it that because it was such a different, you didn't see people daily. You, don't, you didn't see the culture of that area. You're wandering around in a jungle looking for somebody to, to shoot. And uh, that's not, I mean, if you go to a different country, you're involved in trying to order something off a menu or trying to get a hotel room or trying to get transportation from here to there or trying to work out the money conversion for something you want to buy at a market. And that, to me, is more culture shock, just the stuff that's on the item, the items on the menu. And when you're out in the jungle, it's, um, you don't, it's like you're not even in that country. You're in this pretend zone. <laughs> it's 
all the all the rules are different there, and then you're a ways into it before you ever even walk by a village, uh, because at that point we weren't, you know, setting fire to villages and all that sort of thing. It was kind of a wind down mode, and I also I also sometimes think in the total of Vietnam vets, and right now there's a commercial or uh, public service announcement on TV about the vets in Illinois and. Somebody says so many thousands, not realizing that, wow, there'd be that many vets in, in a single state. And I don't know what it is for Iowa, you know, fewer people, so obviously it's a, a lower number. But in Vietnam, for each uh, grunt out in the bush, there was five or six individuals in the rear, you know, whatever they were doing, air traffic control at Tonsonut or Packing my MR, MREs. Yeah, I've heard, MR I've heard the statistic meals. of 11 um, because when you consider your pay, your, yeah, your finance, your all that stuff, make sure you got bullets. Yes. All right, I'm going to go ahead and stop recording now because we've got.